one of the things the Giants pretty clearly need at this point is an, an infielder who can play the middle infield spots and play some defense. And hey, the Cubs, they just signed Dansby Swanson earlier, and they've already got another shortstop who's going to play second. And so is Nick Madrigal a trade possibility for the Giants? We'll get to that question and so many more next. You are Locked On Giants, your daily San Francisco Giants podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome to Locked On Giants, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, where it's your team every day. My name is Ben Kaspik, and on this show, we provide episodes three days a week for now, back to five when pitchers and catchers report, talking about the San Francisco Giants in a way that's data-driven and rational, but also simple, passionate, and accessible to all. I'm a former contributor for the baseball statistics and analysis websites Beyond the Box Score and Rotographs. I've been podcasting about the Giants since 2015, and I'm a lifelong fan. Thank you for making Locked on Giants your first listen every day, or at least three days a week for now. We are free and available wherever you get podcasts. And coming up on today's show, more mailbag questions. Coming up early next week, we're probably going to have, finally, the Zips projections for the Giants. And so whether it's Monday or Tuesday or whatever it is, look out for that, that next week. But today, as spring training somewhat approaches here, we are going to get to some more mailbag questions. The first one coming from Alex who says, with Dansby Swanson to the Cubs, they may have an infield logjam. Is someone like Nick Nick Madrigal a possibility? And I wanted to use this question as an example of how I think it appears the Giants are going to deal with this situation I alluded to in the open there, that they, they, like, a big emphasis, so we thought, was going to be improving the infield defense, improving the defense overall. And I think they did it in the outfield, not in the way... You know, improving from being horrible doesn't necessarily mean going to the other extreme end and being a top three defensive team. It can just be improving to be more league average, and that is technically an improvement. Uh, And there's always a trade-off. I mean, they don't love, like, defense-oriented players at the expense of, you know, hitting. They don't want guys who can't hit but can defend all over the diamond. They, They need you to be able to hit a little bit. And so with Hanniger and with Conforto, Uh, those guys have a track record of being solid in the corners in the outfield. It also moves Jock Peterson out of the outfield uh, in terms of his projected kind of starting point would be DH now, and then Yaz and Slater in center. So that that group looks to be, I don't want to say fixed, but in a better spot. But in the infield, they haven't done anything to like improve the defense. All that's happened is they've lost Evan Longoria and Brandon Belt, two guys Look, they're like in their mid-30s. I don't want to say they're like elite defenders anymore, but certainly defense was generally a strength of those two guys when, you know, they were physically doing well. So I'm not painting necessarily a gloomy picture. I think Brandon Crawford, even though he's in his mid-30s and not what he once was defensively, we saw how he was really good uh, defensively down the stretch after kind of going on the IL to to help heal the knee issue he was having. And then Tyro Estrada, defensive run saved was negative on Estrada, but a lot of other numbers and the eye test to me, he shouldn't be that bad. I think that Estrada may be due for a bounce back defensively. And then at first, in 2021, Lamont Wade Jr. was quite good over there defensively. And actually by the numbers, he was solid there as well in 2022. And a lot of his negative kind of defensive uh quote unquote contributions came in the outfield. And then so at third base, currently you're looking at David VR. So that's to to paint the picture of kind of the setup with your backups being the likes of Wilmer Flores and JD Davis, two guys who are not known as good defenders. Neither really is VR. And so that's why I say you need like because if anybody goes down, you're talking JD Davis or Wilmer Flores kind of filling in. And I just think to finally get to the question a player like Nick Madrigal is ultimately what makes the most sense. So I think that, yes, uh, Alex, Nick Madrigal is a strong kind of name to throw out there. And what makes so much sense about him in this context is that he's optionable. And the reason that matters is because as Giants president of baseball operations, Farhan Zaidi recently said, you can add 
a, a good defensive infielder here, but currently pretty like every roster spot is kind of accounted for. And so there's a cost besides just the acquisition cost of acquiring another player. It bumps somebody else off the roster. And right now everybody kind of has a clear role. So you could trade away from, you know, like the J.D. Davis or Wilmer Flores or even David VR projected roster spot and fill it with a better defender. And that might ultimately make the most sense trading like J.D. Davis for a guy who can play good defense throughout the infield and also hit OK. Uh, that would make a lot of sense. But an optionable player gives even more flexibility in that he doesn't have to be on the roster. And so if there's an injury, like I mentioned, you can you know, to a key defensive player. Like, what if Brandon Crawford goes down? Currently, the the way the the chairs would be, well, how do you say it? The way the, the chairs would be shuffled is that Tyro Estrada would move over to short. Like, and he's not a great, he doesn't have a great arm, kind of throws sidearm, and I don't think that's necessarily the best fit for the shortstop position. But, so not only is that, it's okay, but also you weaken second base because what is who plays second base? It's, you know, you're putting Wilmer Flores there or you start looking to deeper down your depth chart, looking at the likes of Brett Wisely, who was acquired, but is, you know, a, a rookie has no major league experience, I don't believe. And, you know, Isan Diaz, who was added to the 40 man. So he's in play. Those guys are in play. But I think a, a player like Nick Madrigal, who's formerly a pretty solid prospect the fourth overall pick in 2018 kind of bumped out of favor in Chicago with the Cubs with Swanson and Nico Horner now moving to second base and so Madrigal has like no power to speak of but it's the type of guy like they got Tyro Estrada in the first place in this type of move that's something I wanted to point out is like they needed a backup shortstop and you know we were all talking about major league type player backup shortstop options, but they ended up trading for Tyro Estrada and that's how they brought him in. And it ended up being a savvy move and he has emerged as more of an everyday type of player, but they initially got him as an optionable depth piece. And so I think an optionable depth piece, maybe you trade from, you know, your, your outfield, which is kind of full already, like an Elliot Ramos, does he really have a path to playing time? I could see Elliot Ramos being a piece that's dealt for, you know, to address their need for defense in the infield. So anyway, that's my thoughts on that question. Coming up in just a minute, do the Giants normally go with 13 pitchers and 13 position players? If so, what are we looking at with Lamont Wade Jr., Blake Sable? Like, they have a little bit of a roster crunch. How are they going to account for their position player mix and, you know, crunching the numbers, 13 versus 14 and all that? We'll get into it in just a minute. But before we do, this episode is brought to you by Built Bar. Are you looking for a delicious treat, but you don't want all of the fat and calories? I think we can all say that we are. Well, I've got news for you. You've got to try Built Bar. We just got through the holidays. I know my goal is to eat a little bit healthier this year. And if you're like me and you want to eat healthier, but you don't want to compromise taste, then I've got just the thing for you. You've got to try Built. With Built, healthy is actually tasty. We're talking candy bar flavors and yet a healthy profile. It's truly incredible. Just in a typical bar, about 130 calories, four grams of sugar, and a whopping 17 grams of protein. And for Years now, we've been telling you to go to Built.com to get your Built Bars, but now guess what? You can get them at Walmart or Sam's Club as well. Head to your nearest Walmart, walk to the pharmacy section, and grab yourself a box of Built Bars. You can pick up a four-bar box of cookies and cream, double chocolate, or coconut puffs. Doesn't sound healthy, but it is. Or if you're at Sam's Club, run in and gra grab a 13-bar box with our hit flavors, brownie batter, and churro. You can thank me later. All right, as promised, we're going to get to more questions and answers. Next one coming from Brian, who says, a couple questions. So the Giants usually have a 13-13 position player slash pitcher roster. If 13, Wade Jr. and Sable seem like number 12 and 13, or do they give back Sable and go with VR? If not, if not is third really Davis and Flores? And so the answer is that they do normally go with 13 and 13, like 13 pitchers, 13 position players. At various times throughout the year, 
last year, for example, they'll go with like 14 position players, sometimes I think 14 pitchers. So usually it's going to be 12 of one and 14 of the other or 13 and 13 at various times throughout the year. But I think traditionally the most common kind of default is 13 and 13. By the way, thanks for making Lockdown Giants your first listen every day. Lockdown MLB Prospects host Lindsey Crosby is a prospect encyclopedia, and he's going deep on the MLB stars of tomorrow. It's free and available wherever you get podcasts. So yes, just to get into your specific questions, though, if 13, Wade Jr. and Sable seem like number 12 and number 13, I'm just going to give you what I kind of view as the 13 player uh, mix on the position player side. And a lot of these questions, in fact, all of these questions came to me a few weeks ago. And so, you know, I think this question came before they had DFA'd Austin wins. And so suddenly Sable like is on the 40 man and is the only catcher in addition to Joey Bart right now. And Sable is not necessarily even a, a catcher. He's, he plays catcher, but he also plays outfield. But that mix is essentially Estrada at second base. I'm looking through the li- projected lineup on roster resource, so it's going to be kind of a random order here, but this is their projected batting order. Estrada at second, Yastrzemski uh, in center. We're assuming a right-handed pitcher on the mound for this pro- uh, projected lineup. Haniger in right, Jock Peterson at DH, Conforto in left. They've got Flores at third, but I'm going to say David Villar is actually at third here. And Brandon Crawford at short, Lamont Wade Jr. at first. Joey Bart at catcher. And then on the bench, you've got Sable, who has to be in the major leagues. Otherwise, they have to offer him back, as you're alluding to in your question. J.D. Davis on the bench as well. Austin Slater on the bench, platooning with Yastrzemski. And then I've got Flores on the bench, but he could start at third. He could start at first, depending on, like, if VR struggles, then, yeah, you've got a guy who could fill in there. I just am not super high on the defensive potential there for Flores. But it's pretty clear that everybody has a role. Like, I guess you could make the argument that maybe David VR could start the year in the minors, but I think that we did an episode on this essentially talking about how not bringing back belt pushes like Wade and those, you know, Flores and Davis types to first, and it clears a path for David VR. And I think that that's a big emphasis right now for this team is that they want to give opportunities to deserving young players. And, you know, it's a, it's a delicate balance to strike here where, the fans have the expectation that you're going to win now, but the fans also have the expectation, and not just the fans, I mean, it's essential to the health of the organization, that you try to win, but you also uh, need, to, you know, we talk about younger and more athletic. Well, sometimes you've got to give your own guys opportunities to become legit major leaguers, and David VR has that opportunity, so you're not just going to want to, you know, bury him in the minor leagues. He has nothing really to prove. He dominated in AAA. And in fact, he did really well at the major league level in the month of September, uh, went on kind of a home run parade there. And so I think everybody, like Zaidi said, does have a clear role here. And those are the guys. And that's 13 guys. And so I would expect that that's the mixed mix barring a trade. Like I said, maybe you trade a J.D. Davis for that skilled defender because right now JD Davis and Wilmer Flores and even David VR are like really similar in terms of how they profile but I'd probably give the edge to the young guy who maybe the ceiling is even higher because he hasn't yet fully had an opportunity to prove himself and so yeah I mean that's kind of I don't think they give Sable back at this point because currently he's their only other catcher but if he really struggles in spring, Austin wins accepted an outright assignment to AAA. So he's still in the organization. He's just not currently on the 40 man. But if spring training comes along and Sable goes, you know, one for 30 and Austin wins has a nice spring, then you're probably going to see Sable offered back to the Pirates and uh, wins taking his spot on the 40 man and active roster. So that's going to be a little bit of a competition. I also think they maybe are aiming to bring in another catcher on a minor league deal to compete for that spot in the same fashion. But, and it could be Bart. I mean, Bart has an option remaining. And so you could potentially, if Bart is the guy who goes one for 30 with 20 strikeouts in spring, maybe you see Sable and wins break camp in the majors. We'll see. Although I feel similarly, like you, if you've got them, you, you might as well kind of let them sink or swim at this point. 
with this team. So anyway, that's that's how I would answer that one. Aiden says, who is one player you think will significantly help the team that might not be an obvious candidate? And so I, I actually wanted to answer this question without like preparing too much for it. I think the guy that I come around to is probably in the bullpen. I, I'm kind of leaning towards some of these uh, bullpen arms such as Cole Waits. And I'm, I'm scrolling through on the depth chart here to find them. Cole Waits and perhaps RJ Dabovich, who is not on the 40 man, but Cole Waits is. He made a brief cameo towards the end of last year. He was actually the first player drafted and developed by this quote unquote new front office to reach the major leagues. And and he flashed really impressive stuff when he was here. Got a kind of herky jerky motion and high velocity and a slider uh, that's a pretty good pitch as well. And I mean, he ultimately got, you know, five and two thirds in the major leagues. But look, not everyone's going to be Camilo Duvall, but, uh, you know, they they add Camilo Duvall to the 40 man. He was going to debut late in 2020, but didn't. Uh, Then he does debut in 2021 and then has like fully broken out. And I think that with Dabovich and with Cole Waits, you've got the potential where maybe they even start the season in the major leagues, one of them. Farhan Zaidi has hinted at that, and I think this organization has a pretty good track record with kind of targeting the right relievers to come up from within the organization and be given that chance, and they seem to be high on Waits and Dabovich, and I see why. Dabovich really struggled upon a promotion to AAA, but really dominated in AA in 2022, and so I would expect either one of those guys, maybe both, to get opportunities and potentially thrive in those bullpen roles in 2023. So coming up in just a minute, we are going to discuss the possibility of a Trent Grisham trade because, I don't know, like I said, the Giants didn't exactly make their outfield defense great. And so does a guy like Trent Grisham of the San Diego Padres, annoying player when you're playing against him, but a guy you'd kind of want on your team, even if he had serious offensive struggles last year. Does he make any sense for the Giants? We'll get into it in just a minute, but before we do. All right, as promised, Trent Grisham. Tom says, any way the Giants would swing an intra-division trade with the Padres for Trent Grisham? And if so, what would it take to get him? And so, I don't think, like, I completely kind of ignore the narrative about intra-division trades and that teams aren't going to do that. I think maybe if you're talking about a superstar, then you you just don't necessarily want to trade the guy in the division. But if you're getting the best return from a team in the division, then I think these days that's not as much of a thing as maybe it used to be. So I wouldn't rule it out for that reason. The reason I'm not ruling it out, but arguing against the that there's any kind of likelihood of this happening is exactly what we've already discussed today, which is that their projected roster is full. And so whose spot is Trent Grisham going to take? Their outfield already consists of Hanniger, Conforto, Yastrzemski, and Slater. And just by the way, the construction of that roster that Farhan Zaidi has said is pretty set and all the playing time is accounted for, and I'm saying the same thing as I look at it, is that you, you're you not going to be able to platoon Conforto or Hanniger. Hanniger, there's no way you would platoon him based on his career splits. Yes, he's better against lefties than he is against righties, but solidly above average production even against same-handed pitching. And so there's no way he's a platoon player. Conforto, it's a little bit more of a question. He's kind of got Mike Yastrzemski splits in his career in terms of against left-handed pitching. And Yastrzemski has gone off and on being a platoon player. We're currently talking about him platooning in center field with Austin Slater. But if you look at like, you cannot, I will keep saying this because it seems that this kind of logic doesn't always factor in when people are talking about the Giants and their platoons and whatnot, is that you cannot platoon at every spot. Because like we just said, they off, they'll they go maybe 14 position players, 12 pitchers, uh, but usually 13 and 13. And you've got nine spots in your lineup, including the DH now. And so if you platooned at every spot, you'd have 18 position players and eight 
pitchers, which is just not happening. So, you know, you, you can't platoon everywhere. I think the current platoon spots are Jock Peterson, Mike Yastrzemski. I guess if Yaz is just having a great year, Slater could possibly platoon with Conforto and vice versa. If Conforto is just kind of being a monster, then you platoon Yaz instead. But you're not platooning them both. It doesn't really work that way looking through the roster. And then Lamont Wade Jr. is the other kind of obvious platoon spot where J.D. Davis or David Villar or Wilmer Flores would be kind of the platoon partner there. So anyway, what was the question? What was the question? Uh, Trent Grisham. So in the outfield, you're kind of full. And so that's only four outfielders. And the old way of thinking, like you've got your three starters and then your fourth outfielder is kind of doesn't apply here because your fourth outfielder is a platoon partner in Slater. And, but also you've got someone like Tyro Estrada who can play the outfield in a pinch. And so if that gives you five outfielders, I just don't see any way. And Blake Sable who can catch and play the outfielders outfield. So there's six outfielders and Jock Peterson, there's seven Peterson being your seventh on the depth chart behind. I mean, maybe he's ahead of Sable. I don't know, but you've clearly got some coverage there in the outfield and you've also got guys in the minors like Elliot Ramos. So I just don't see a fit, especially it's not like Grisham has been having great seasons, right? He's good defensively. I think he's a good base runner as well still, but he had a miserable offensive season. So he's kind of he's kind of like, I don't know, a worse hitting version of Mike Yastrzemski, a better defending but worse hitting version of Mike Yastrzemski right now. And I like Trent Grisham. And if the Giants had... You know, if they didn't have Yastrzemski, then I'd say yes, but I just don't see the fit. And so what would it take to get him? I, I haven't looked into this too seriously because I don't see the fit. It depends on how many more years of club control Grisham has. And as I scroll through, he's got three more years of club control. So he's kind of similar to Yaz in a lot of ways. I think Yaz might even have four more years of team control, but it, it actually might be three. So I don't see the fit. I see him as a Yaz kind of parallel and the guy who makes more sense to me is Ha-Sung Kim but you know it would come at the expense of somebody else you're not going to probably be able to get Ha-Sung Kim for like JD Davis and so I don't know could you get Ha-Sung Kim for JD Davis and Elliot Ramos maybe probably not but maybe I think Ha-Sung Kim just makes a ton of sense for the San Francisco Giants roster but it would probably come at the expense of a JD Davis type on the active roster and he's all you know they're both Grisham and Kim are both on the Padres so he's the one I think makes more sense I would love Hassan Kim on the San Francisco Giants so the next question comes from Darius who says with the addition of Taylor Rogers to the bullpen what other additions do you see the Giants making that can improve the pen free agency trade or in-house so we already kind of talked about this and again this is an old question and of course by old I mean I asked for mailbag questions like three weeks ago and I'm still getting through them. But of course, since then, they also signed Luke Jackson. But we have heard that Luke Jackson may start this season on the 60-day injured list. And that would mean, I mean, you can't put a guy on the 60-day IL until the season starts, which means he he would have to be on the injured list for two months or 60 days, which would mean he would miss the first two months. And that's roughly the time frame for his return from Tommy John surgery. It's a two-year deal with a third-year option. And doing so, putting a guy on the 60-day IL would open up a 40-man spot. And so you could see potentially like if RJ Dabovich has that great spring I was alluding to as a possibility, you could possibly see Jackson go on the 60-day IL, add Dabovich to the 40-man roster, and insert him into the bullpen. And so I think Waits and Dabovich, of course, Luke Jackson will eventually factor in. And then you've got Camilo Doval, you've got Taylor Rogers, and you've got John Brebbia and Tyler Rogers, who both had good seasons in 2022. Even though Rogers was a bit up and down, he's got a great kind of career track record. Uh, Scott Alexander, who is really good down the stretch. And then some of these starting pitchers, Giants are so deep with starters, currently looking at the projected pen, you're probably looking at you know, a Jacob Junis and or Alex Wood or Di Sclafani projecting into that bullpen. And also somebody to not sleep on is Thomas Zapucky. I'm pretty high on him, actually. Uh, impressive stuff and good projections. And 
I think he's going to, he doesn't have any minor league options as far as I know. And so he's probably going to be in that major league kind of opening day bullpen as one of the last guys in the, in the ladder there. But I don't know, suddenly with their in-house options, their bullpen could actually be pretty deep. And then with the starters being in the pen as well, it's going to be really interesting to see how that shakes out. Anyway, that is all the time we have for today. Thanks again for making Locked on Giants your first listen today. Now make your second listen Locked on MLB Prospects. Host Lindsey Crosby is a prospect encyclopedia, and he's going deep on the MLB stars of tomorrow. It's free and available wherever you get podcasts. Once again, my name is Ben Kaspik. Check me out on Twitter at Ben Kaspik, K-A-S-P-I-C-K. If you like this show, please consider rating it or leaving a review or hitting thumbs up or whatever you can do. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Anyway, can't wait to be with you again three times next week at least. So have a great weekend. Thanks again for listening. You are now Locked on Giants.